Thank you for choosing Minority Alliance Organization meeting today. Today we'll be discussing a few current events currently going on within the country as far as issues directed towards the George, George Floyd case, uh, kind of giving an update on things that have been stated across the case so far, uh, to kind of taking a look at the Georgia SB 202 voting law uh, with that being passed uh, over the past month and kind of uh, what came with that law being passed and things of that nature. Um, flipping over into the border crisis also and speaking slightly on the end today about uh, certain things we can do to affect uh, issues at the border. Um, it being that we're an organization to attack things, issues dealing with minorities, and you're having a huge influx of minorities from a lot of other countries coming through our southern border at this time, uh, especially a ton of children that are unaccompanied. Um, kind of starting at the top, Mark, today, uh, speaking on the George Floyd case, um, I know over the past, uh, last week was the start of the case, uh, and we're kind of rolling into week two of it now. Um, we've seen a couple of the facts uh, out on the board now. Um, beyond everything that's been stated, uh, what are the main issues that we need to be focusing on as far as this is why, you know, uh, Officer Chauvin is guilty of murder, or this is why he's not guilty, or what are the issues in the case where we should put our focus that actually matter? So in the case that we've seen so far, and I think it's important to point out that, you know, the case is still in a very, very early stage. This trial is in a very, very early stage. You know, the prosecution right now is going through its cadence of presenting, you know, setting the table with witness testimony and uh, background about training that the officers get and some of the background about how similar situations have gone to kind of lay out a scenario of kind of preemptively attacking the defense that this is a situation where he was just dealing with a, a subject who was resisting and that may have been on the, under the influence of drugs and, you know, uh, that the crowd may have been hostile and therefore the best thing for him to do would have been to hold his position and something tragic happened. Um, I think that by, you know, what, what you saw from a lot of the different camera angles, and obviously the camera is gonna end up being the greatest witness of this case because it showed in its real time and real format, what was actually going on. It showed the terror that George Floyd had in his face when he was being detained by the officers and when he was worried about being shot. It showed him when he was being, when he was on the ground that he was prone on the ground and his hands were handcuffed behind him. It showed the crowd and the fact that the crowd wasn't coming towards the officers, they weren't moving away, they were literally standing there. And many of them were pleading, many of them were asking why, you know, why they were sitting in that position, asking him, to, asking the officer to get off of that position. You know, there were a couple of people who, who used some colorful language about that, but it in no way got overly aggressive it showed the amount of time that the officer was on his neck after he stopped moving. And I think that, if nothing else, is probably the most important part of the prosecution's case to this point, because a lot of the violence that you see happens from officers to people, and especially in this case, what we're talking about people of color, is that is this, uh, the, the theme that is constantly put out there of the subject being a threat, of the subject being a danger. Well, what we see in the video itself is a man face down, prone, hand, handcuffed behind his back, not moving. And you also, and you still see several officers continue to lay across his body, across his legs, with that officer with his knee firmly across his neck. And that stayed there for many minutes after he stopped moving, after he stopped talking, after he stopped breathing hard, or, or even making the gestures of being uncomfortable, that all went away because he basically went out. And the amount of time that that took and the amount of time after that happened that he continued to be on that neck is a very, very powerful um, proponent for the case. And it's going to be very, very difficult for them, you know, moving forward to try and, and I'm sure they're going to have all the different things. They're going to try to say he was on drugs. They're going to try to say what kind of drug it was. They're going to try to bring up things in his background to try and make him look you know, characterize however they want to characterize him. 
But the bottom line is none of those things were known at the time and what you have, you know, going on at that time on the video is going to end up being the best witness of all, at least so far from what I've seen. Now, something kind of been rambling around for me uh, while watching over the past few days, um, kind of looking at a few of the possible outcomes and how I feel, you know, this case might play out. And uh, a huge thing that makes it, um, I think it's gonna be harder to find justice uh, in this case. Personally, uh, kind of spoke on a couple minutes ago about how it was a few officers, you know, laying across his body, you know, at the time of his uh, death, which I think that kind of does add a little bit of, uh, I think that's kind of plays into one of the facts, you know, that's gonna be aimed at, you know, that truly matter matters but uh without having all the officers um facing at least some level of a, a charge in this case do you think that we will even get true full justice justice out of this situation or what is the best possible outcome that we can hope for so there will absolutely not be the type of closure inducing justice that will come from this case that everybody's looking for. Uh, as you said, there is only one officer charged with murder in this case. And even if that officer were to be charged with murder, and again, we'll have to see how that goes because what this is going to devolve into eventually is a battle of the experts and you know what causes death, what didn't cause death, can we see that it caused death, can we testify that it caused death. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of ground still to cover. But it's about, you know, it, sometimes it's not about getting full and total justice. It's about showing or about at least getting a crack in the door and something that could lead to justice overall and more justice as time goes on. For many, many years, we, you know, a, a, you know as an African-American myself, you're an African-American, we've seen it. We personally felt it. I even felt it this year, early this year, where you feel that kind of terror and that kind of helplessness in the hands of an officer. And to know, and we've known for so long, for so many decades, that there very likely would be no consequence for whatever it is they decided to do to us for whatever reason they decided to do it. And the reason why so many people are able to look at this case is that this was as close to a public lynching as one could see with their own eyes in the millennium. So this is an opportunity to put that system on trial. And even though it's not all of the officers that are gonna be, that are on trial here, it's not the system that trained them that's on trial here. It's not the absence of uh, psychological testing and screening that kept officers like this off the street that's on trial here. But if we can, but if you get a little bit of justice here, just a little bit where you can see that a person could do this and not get away with it, then it at least opens the door for other cases and for other people to be able to actually look at these things with a critical eye. Stop, you know, giving such blanket uh, policy like qualified immunity and things like that and allow for there to be equal justice under the law regardless of what you do and even if you are law enforcement it doesn't give you a blank check to be able to do things like this to citizens and just go home and be done with it or you know you lose your job and you can go one county over and get another job as a police officer and things like that so will there be total justice in this case absolutely not no we can go ahead and let that dream go right now but if we are looking at a, a, a potential where you could have that crack in the door to be able to actually open it up and be able to get something in there and it, it leads to real change, that could be the start of something good. And so if nothing else, that is something that we should be able to look forward to and get out of this possibly as you know, something we can build on moving forward. Yes, yeah, sir. And I mean, that kind of, played into uh, my second question, or my final question, uh, speaking on the case is, um, you know, who's at fault overall? Uh, even with this case, we're seeing, uh, as you said, an individual being charged with a crime. But is this an issue 
that kind of starts at the policy level? Is it an issue that starts at the training level or is it, you know, an issue that it was just uh, this individual officer uh, who had an off day and, you know, did something horrible? Uh, where does a certain problem like this lie within uh, the chain of events that led up to George Floyd's death? Well, uh, as a direct answer to your question of where uh, does the fault lie with the officer, with the system of training, with the policy, with the uh, spending and everything, the, the direct answer to the question is yes. It's all of the above. We are getting uh, an education in the word systematic because it is the entire system. It is the amount of, it is the policy that is put in place of how these things are carried out. It's the amount of budget that these guys are given it's the amount of screening that is happening to make sure that you're not hiring a racist sociopath and putting a badge on a gun because he is willing to take $38,000 a year, okay? There are people who manage fast food restaurants that make double the price of a patrol officer in this country. And that's just a simple truth. And so when you're doing that and you're choosing people from among the neighborhood, people who are willing to apply, it's not a drafted position. You have to apply for it and go through the academy and things like that. You know, you're looking at situations where you're not going to be able to filter through and truly get people who should be in that position. We haven't given enough, um, we haven't given enough power to the idea of what it's like to police your own citizens what it's like to walk around with that type of authority, with that type of the ability to restrain and detain anyone you want for whatever reason you deem as necessary. To have a gun and to be able to discharge that weapon based on the, whatever criteria happens to be in your head at the moment and have a, 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 an implicit bias on your side about the fact that if you pulled that trigger, it was probably for a good reason. That person probably did something. And there isn't enough credence going into how do we make sure that the right people are actually the ones who are ending up on the street with this level of power and authority. We have not given that its proper respect. And when you treat power without respect, you get hurt by it every time. And unfortunately, this is something that falls disproportionate on minority communities. So going through a case like this, the ultimate end game that we want to see to being able to have this, because again, I'm not anti-police at all. Uh, we need police. We obviously need police. We are obviously not a society that is capable of policing you know, itself. You know, we're not an honor system. So we need to have that. And the police need to also have stake in that future. They need to have a stake in performing their job the right way and the whole, and, and living up to protecting and serving. You know, and I know we spoke about this on another uh, another topic and another call some time ago, but you know, I had heard uh, ideas from people like Dick Gregory who had said, you know, you give a you give these officers, you, you make their training process hard, but you give them the type of benefits, the type of pay, the type of things that number one, they can't live without. So you have something to lose, really something to lose when you're out there and you're making these judicious decisions. And you're also giving them the type of budget that they need to where you're not only having the best people, but you have the best equipment and you have the sort of backing and understanding that these jobs are going to be, perform be performed from a gentle hand, dealing with people, that we are giving proper respect to not only what the officers need to do to be on the street, but also to the citizens, to, to mental health, to what people are going through when they're going into these situations, to the fact that when you show up to a domestic violence situation, that you know the, the adrenaline is already through the roof for both of the people involved, and then that, that's going to drive the officer's adrenaline up and things like that. More intervention-laden results. You know, we, we need to completely rethink how this whole thing is funded and how the laws are written in order to do it. So, you know, I, I think that we have a long way to go to fixing this problem, but I think we have to identify where the problem starts. So it's a systematic issue, which means the entire system requires that level of attention to change it. Most definitely. And I totally agree uh, on that end. You know, uh, as I said, when I was kind of looking over it myself, uh, 
I was kind of watching the case the other day, and I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, uh, whether it's Officer uh, Chauvin who kind of has to pay the penalty uh, in this aspect for uh, this occurrence, um, with us having so many other occurrences and not seeing justice uh, as in the uh, Breonna Taylor case and the way that that one played out, um, my big thing that I was focused on is, you know, how do we completely minimize these issues as much as possible across the board because uh yes we might see these officers face as these are this is the one who pulled the trigger but these problems and these uh issues that lead to this are way bigger than any in any individual officer so uh that's more so you know with that question what we're trying to uh focus on because even after the george floyd case is over um there's plenty of other cases down the road. There's uh, a ton of cases that have happened in the past that may need to be revisited, uh, even in that aspect. But well, I, so I was just going to say, I, I can tell you that, you know, when we're talking about, you know, systematic change, you know, that's sort of the part where we look at, you know, policy, for example. You know, a good question would be, you know, like, just to, just to cherry pick the Breonna Taylor case. You know, when we, you know, when they decided that law enforcement went after the New York Mafia, in order to take down the New York Mafia, they had thousands of hours of audio. You know, they followed people around, they took pictures, they got low-level guys to flip on higher-level guys, and it was a, a really long, drawn-out investigation. When it comes to the case of, like, you know, for somebody like Brianna Taylor, I realize that, you know, that's kind of an apples and oranges comparison, but why would you be doing a no-knock warrant for drugs? That's not the sort of thing where there's, you know, a no-knock warrant needs to be an imminent danger situation. Outside of someone is about to commit imminent harm to someone else, if there's a hostage situation or something like that, there really needs to be no justifiable reason to just barge in and just kick in a door and just go into somebody's house with guns up in the middle of the night in the dark, you know, in a residential neighborhood. Like we need to relook, we need to think and, and relook at policies that allow for such things, and that there's just no justifiable reason for it. Let's say, you know, let's say Brianna Taylor, you know, her boyfriend were moving dope, moving big amounts of dope. Um, is anyone gonna not smoke dope if you don't kick in this door? Like it doesn't make any sense. And these are the sort of, you know, things that we need to look at policy-wise. So like I said, for every subject that we put up when it comes to like training, pay, budget, policy, qualified immunity, how officers are chosen, what power they have, every single one of those things is a, is a piece of that system. And each one of them needs to be addressed in how they are applied. And that's what's going to be able, that's what's going to change this. We got to stop you know, just thinking that these things are something, and, and we also have to stop blaming the person. You know, when you blame the victim, you know, a lot of times you say, well, well you know, that person was in the drugs, or, or that person may have been high, or something like that. Like, you, you can't take away the responsibility of the failure of the system. When, you know, when we say the system is that, when the system, you know, breaks down, the system fails, you know, you, you can't take your eyes off of the fact that the system failed, no matter how much you may want to do that and or how indictable a victim in that case may be. The system is still the system. It is what is supposed to be law enforcement. So it has to be as close to impeccable as possible because you're dealing with the policing of your own citizenry. That requires, and that, that sort of power requires the greatest of responsibility. And just kind of touching on your last point there, uh, speaking on this before uh, we switch over, kind of every time, well, in many of the cases where we have had uh, victims that have lost their lives, minority victims who have lost their lives to officers, we often see uh, these blemishes that pop up and they try to uh, defame their character uh, and things of that nature. And I think that has to be another uh, huge push, especially from the minority community uh, all around is uh, this 
you trying to make this issue a drug issue that should be the outrage coming from uh the minority community right now when looking at this case is the fact that we're not going to let you well wash this man's life under the rug uh and try to throw it all off as he was a druggie having a drug problem in this country as we said you know we'll probably have to dive a little bit into a discussion uh dealing with that and mental health uh in the minority community on one of our episodes but uh drug problem is not you that doesn't make you a criminal because you partake and put a drug into your body your own personal body does not make you a criminal you're not out there hurting anyone else or doing anything to anyone else that doesn't make you a criminal so for them to make or try to throw even drugs into this case for me was a huge uh it kind of upset me a ton because uh this is something that whether it's drugs whether it's uh they have a record whether it's uh you know, this person was a felon in the past. It's been across the board over the past few years, a couple of cases that I've personally had my eye on where I've seen them constantly make the person who lost their life in the situation uh, basically seem like the aggressor. Uh, when, and, and normally nine times out of 10 in that situation, the one where they lost their life, uh, they were nine times out of 10, you know, helpless. Issues like that, you know, they don't start at, you know, this person was druggy. We got to quit letting uh, uh, people's characters, we got to quit letting people's characters be defamed in these situations is all, basically. Yeah. The last thing I can say on this subject is uh, one rung of that ladder, one piece of that pie, that systematic uh, thing that I was talking about, one that doesn't get brought up enough and needs to be brought up more is how the media covers these things. They make this narrative, they paint this picture. You're absolutely right. Now, looking at uh, the Georgia voting law that was passed uh, about two weeks ago now, SB202, um, we saw initially at the signing of this actual law uh, by uh, Governor Kemp in Georgia. Um, Representative Park Cannon uh, kind of came to his door and there was a huge uh, commotion that was made news uh, where she was basically trying to stop uh, the signing of this law uh, in a place. Uh, just kind of wanted to give an update, speak on that situation. I know we've been talking about it over the past few weeks. Uh, we both were able to watch the video kind of around the same time and just... What's your take on Miss Park Cannon and you know her passion behind trying to get this bill stopped, you know, and how she felt kind of helpless herself and why this was kind of her last uh stance uh when we did see her, you know, on the video that went viral there. Yeah, well, a couple of things, you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad to report that uh they announced today that Miss Cannon's not going to be charged because the initial charge was uh, felony obstruction. So they actually charged her with a felony that day, um, you know, which, is, uh, which is very interesting to me when I, when I consider that and I just suppose that versus what we saw on January 6th and what we saw on the charges coming out of January 6th. So I uh, just wanted to put that out there. Um, you know, one of the things that goes that speaks to that desperation that she had over the situation is the helplessness of local politics. I know you, know you and I have spoken about local politics and the importance of local politics many, many times. I mean, ad nauseum, you know, on these shows that we do. And the reason that we bring this up is because when you have a situation like this, she is a, she is a state representative. Uh, you know, she is a Georgia Congresswoman, but she was absolutely powerless because you're in a situation where if you have a majority and if you have a super majority as the Republicans have in the state of Georgia, and as you see across the country in a lot of state legislatures, you know, you can have a situation where something seems so egregious. And let's make no mistake, you know, the biggest problem with this, with this voting law is its egregiousness. This voting law would not be in place and they, they would not be doing what they're doing right now if the candidate they wanted had won. 
And the reason I can say that with such confidence is because we had a similar, a similar, um, similarly led legislature in 2016. And when you, they had the outcome that they wanted, there was no change, the widespread change to how voting was done and you know, when, when it should be done and how it should be done and all those other things. So, you know, she felt helpless because she knows that the constituents that she represents were going to be disproportionately affected by it in a negative way and that there was just no debate about it. There's nothing to talk. They weren't allowing the type of debate that in the exchange of ideas that that uh, legislation is supposed to be about, you know, and this is this it speaks to a greater problem that we have throughout the country, not just in state legislatures, but uh, especially on the national level, where we're not uh, having the exchange of ideas, we're not talking about these things. People who have the majority are just bulldozing ahead with an agenda, and they just go for it, and you know they kind of just let it stand for itself, and it doesn't matter where the constituency you know, lies in this. You know, what was going on and the, the laws that were being passed in Georgia were not bipartisan in any manner. And, and again, I don't speak on bipartisanship as in Republicans and Democrats in the House or Senate or in a governor's office. I mean amongst the citizens, amongst its voters. If you, you know, when you're looking at the citizenry, it is disproportionately a negative effect on the higher population and the higher density of uh, areas of the state. And because of the way that, you know, socio demographic know, that means it's going to disproportionately affect minorities, people of color. So, you know, for Representative Cannon, um, you know, so there was a helplessness about it that, you know, this thing was going to go into place. It was going to harm people for quite some time to come and was going to become a precedent. This is the most important part, going to become a precedent decision that affects other states doing this and the inability of anyone else to come along and undercut it because it would have been labeled as a precedent law moving forward. So I definitely understand the, ang the angst and the, and the agitation and the helplessness that went along with that. And, you know, she, she banged on the door, you know, she knocked on the door, you know, we all saw the video, she knocked on the door, she wasn't outwardly disrespectful, she harmed no one, she was unable to even cause even a minor interruption to the procedure and, you know, she was arrested. She was arrested. She was handcuffed. She was perp walked out of the building and charged with a felony. You know, there is no scenario in which that sort of um, indecency is permit should be permissible. You know, we've seen a lot of stunts that have happened, you know, in the House of Representatives, U.S. House of Representatives on the Senate floor. We've seen a lot of stunts in a lot of state houses over the years. And we, you know, there's certain demographics that I can tell you that I have not seen led away in handcuffs and charged with felony obstruction, but this black woman was. So you know, we have to call these things out for what they are. So you know, I definitely feel her pain on that, and you know, th there is a helplessness in the community about it. And I think that you know, some of those business leaders were able to speak to that. And did they get into the head of some of these corporate guys? Yeah, they did, and they should have. Because though there are plenty of people who think that corporations should stay out of politics, well, I actually agree with that. But if they're going to stay out of politics, then they shouldn't be donating as much money as they do to politics. They influence our politics all the time. They are the driving force in our politics because they are where the gigantic, overwhelming majority of these uh, large donations and, you know, and, and you know, where the money comes from that's moving these things along and moving these policies along. It is for their interest. So if it works for one, it should work for the other. And if you're going to be involved with the campaign donations, then you need to be involved when these things are disproportionately affecting your citizens and your work base and, the, and your customers, quite frankly, in these areas. You don't get to be on the sidelines for one while you put your money on behind the other. And I'm glad that it got exposed that way. And I'm glad it made people uncomfortable. Yes, sir, most definitely. Uh, kind of for me, you know, when it comes to any bill, any representative, uh, whether Republican, Democrat, whether we, I, I personally like them or not, uh, it's always going to be with this organization, my uh, objective on emphasizing if there is a certain good uh, that comes out of a certain law 
or policy that's being written up and kind of putting what are the negatives also. Uh, so people kind of have a view of both. Um, with this bill here, when speaking on the negative and the good, um, as simple as you can make it, if I could pick uh, just the, well, with this law here, there's really one good point. And we kind of discussed it kind of in our uh, pre-meeting today, um, speaking on uh, the usage of your state ID uh, instead of a signature validation. Um, I believe that that is something that needs to be implemented, but that's something that needs to be implemented in the uh, universal voting law uh, nationally. So uh, I think that was one good point that was wrote up in this bill. But uh, when you have representatives that are coming up uh, from Georgia saying, oh, there are a ton of good pieces in the bill that uh, people actually need to delve into and really read into. Uh, as you kind of said earlier, you know, when it's more uh, negative things that affect the group of people and uh, their voting power uh, out of a voting bill, that's too much negative when it comes to this is supposed to be a voting bill, something that uh, helps to only make voting uh, easier to the uh, average civilian. Um, so in that aspect, you know, Mark, uh, I know you already said, you know, you you said scrap the bill totally, but uh, even in looking at it in that light, what is uh, beyond the ID uh, factor? Is there anything else good we could take from this bill or uh, is the negative here something that outweighs any anything positive within this bill is a bill that totally needs to be scrapped? Well, I can tell you this. There are a couple of things that on the outward surface appear to be um, pretty good. I mean, it, it has a longer, by a few days, it has a longer uh, early voting period than some states have. Uh, in some rural areas, the polling places are open a little bit longer. Um, you know, the, the ID thing that we talked about, you know, there's also a good thing. So, uh, you know, I, I think you know, definitely call that for what it is. Now, get, now it's time to go into the other side of that coin. When you look at um, polling places closing, um, universally closing at, at a certain time, whether it's in a place like Fulton County or you know a much much smaller county, well, when you have so much more of the population living in an area, it is going to basically hurt voting because those you know you have people who are working from nine to five you have people who are working some odd hours and by not allowing them to have that type of flexibility to be able to vote is basically saying because you're poor and because you have a job that works long hours you're basically out of our system that isn't you know that that's that's just bad um i know a lot of people got hung up on the sensationalized part which is the part where you can't bring food or water to someone standing in line even though, you know, Georgia was one of the places that was noted in the last election cycle of having lines where people stood in it for eight, nine, and sometimes 10 hours. And under this law, people would be in line even longer than that. That's the sensationalized part, but it, it glosses over the most insidious part. The most insidious part of this bill is that for any reason that the state legislature decides, the state legislature can take over the election at any point and take the power away from the Secretary of State to do with what they will. That is a license to hijack any election that has an outcome you do not like. If this, and I can go on this limb pretty confidently that if this law were in place in November, you would not have seen Biden win that state. You would not have seen John Ossoff win that state. You would not have seen Raphael Warnock win that seat. And that's all there is to it. So when you put in things like that, that, that is not, that is not a bill or law that is, that is meant to help citizens in the state of Georgia. That is meant to protect power when you have it and you feel it slipping. That is all there is to it. There's no way to sugarcoat that. You know, and the other thing that I would say to this is when you put in any type of law, or any type of bill, you're introducing it for a reason. A good example is when you had 
people introduce background checks and, and other ideas when we see a mass shooting by someone who bought a gun three days before they committed the mass shooting, okay? There's a, a clear-cut reason whether the bill passes or not. There's a clear-cut reason why we should do something. Something happened and we think that this is wrong and we should try to change it. That should be how legislation works. This particular voting law and the others like it going on around the country and debate going on around the country is built off of a premise, off of a feeling, which was implanted by a lie. That is all there is to that, okay? There was no voter fraud in Georgia. So for if, if anybody in the citizenry feels that there was, it's because people got on TV and said it over and over and over again. It did not actually happen. There was investigations. There was recounts, multiple of them. And if you had some, you would have found some because you had the exact same Republican legislature you had a sec you had you know a Republican Secretary of State and an entire and a Republican governor's office. So you have an, a monolithic apparatus of legislation. So if there were actual voter fraud, you would have found it. So it did not exist, but the lie kept going, and that 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 built a feeling amongst some of the citizens that yeah maybe this was stolen, maybe this wasn't right, maybe there was something to this. And then you built a law based off that feeling and say, and they said it over and over again. They gave the game away by going on TV multiple times and saying, well, this helps voter confidence. You know, what helps voter confidence is their leadership telling the truth. What helps voter confidence is people being able to have access and know that regardless of what type of job I have, I, ha I live in Georgia, I have my ID, I'm going to vote. And I'm going to be able to vote. And then they're not going to try to legislate me and people like me out of it. And that's what took place here. It, 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 it's super important for people to call out the legitimate result of the issue. None of what I said is my opinion. Everything I just said here is actual fact based on what has taken place and the effects that those, that those things are going to have on those people. Yes, sir. And I mean, the, my last statement when it does come to uh, voting, yet again, uh, I would like for uh, our members and people who do have the uh, opportunity to listen to our videos uh, to go back and actually focus on a couple of our uh, segments, specifically talking about voting laws uh, nationally and uh, just how we feel personally uh, diving a little bit deeper on voting laws. But voting is one of the most essential things to this whole democratic process. Uh, without it, none of this process works. Uh, this is something that we got to make sure that every citizen uh, in America has the opportunity, whether, as you said, you know, especially if you work a late job, you're doing one of the uh, most important jobs as to keeping our economy going especially we see the cooks who work late, uh, the people who work nursing jobs who may work long and odd hours and uh, may not get in off till late, uh, have an opportunity to go in and vote. And now, you know, their days on voting may be slimmer, their times on being able to make it may be shortened. Uh, when, as I said, with this process being as important as it is, we should only make it easier for people to vote and never harder in any way, form or fashion. Um, flipping over to our last topic today, kind of speaking about uh, the border crisis. Uh, as I said, you know, I'm watching this on the news and, you know, I'm able to kind of see it from a view of, you know, I have a few family members who uh, have migrated uh, to the America um, and things of that nature, but with you living currently in Texas and being directly uh, seeing the results of a lot of the uh, the issues going on at the border right now, Mark, uh, I kind of feel like you're in a better position than me to kind of speak on the border crisis um, and just how it's becoming a very chaotic issue for the uh, Texas state government at this point and uh, what can we do as far as the national government uh, to come assist uh, now in this manner with it becoming a big issue? So the first step in understanding how big the issue is is taking a, a step back and looking at the totality of the issue and what's happening on both sides of the border. 
So what you have that simultaneously is happening is you have a president that um, that kind of wanted to take a more humanitarian tone towards how we're dealing with the border issue. And, and many and many times he's already, he's you know continuously said that the border is still closed, but they're not going to be as draconian towards people who are you know claiming asylum. Um, what you have in you know, in the United States with some of the legislatures in a state like Texas and a state like Arizona is that you have people who are taking advantage of a situation where we're seeing more children show up at the border, a lot more children show up at the border, numbers we've never seen before, but in total numbers of people, it's on par with many years that we've seen in the past. Um, and they're taking that and you're able to sensationalize the parts that need to be sensationalized to make this and, and, and turn this and, and make, you know, crisis and give it a graphic with its own music and things like that to make it seem like it's out of control. Uh, and what you also have south of the border is that you have a situation where they're taking advantage of that more humanitarian tone and you have a misinformation campaign. America's not the only place that has misinformation going on through, you know, through its media and through its social media and things like that. So you have some mis misinformation saying, hey, it's wide open. You need to go up or you need to send your kids up and things like that and, and, and they'll be able to get through. So you have all three of those things kind of converging into this one situation. Um, you know, we got into this problem and this has been, this is the result of not dealing with problems when there are problems and kind of kicking the can down the road over and over and over again, you know, eventually you get to a point where you have to deal with something. You know, I, I call the border, it's like our check engine light, right? If America were a car, it's definitely our check engine light. And sometimes, you know, when you see the check engine light, it's time to get something checked. It's time to look at it. It's time to deal with it. But a lot of people go, well, I just need to make it to work and back and uh, well, I'm off in two days and I'll get it looked at or something like that. And then it ends up getting ignored and ignored and ignored for that one day that that car clocks out on you. And now you have a serious problem that's going to cost you a lot more to deal with and, and instead of dealing with it at the time. For over 30 years now, we've been cutting back on some of the you know aid that we've been able to give some of these other countries. And I'm not a big fan of just handing people money and things like that. But we also have to recognize that sometimes that is an investment in your own national security. And that whatever it is that's driving people north, because I, I don't know about you, but I've never been motivated based on my own surroundings to take a 2,000 mile walk north in order to get out of my situation. So we need to start looking at what it is that causes things like that, because I'm going to tell you right now, it's a dishwashing job at Chick-fil-A is not what they are dreaming of when they take that walk. You know, so we, you know, there needs to be some serious, serious, not just discussion going on with, within our country, but some serious diplomatic discussion about the infrastructure in a place like Honduras or Guatemala, and a serious conversation about what's going on there and what we can do and where we can invest our resources because the type of resources that we're investing at the border right now and the kind of in, in money that it will take to fix such a problem you know the last president talked about a border wall which he and ultimately didn't spend what he wanted to spend for the whole thing there were always you know there were all sorts of reasons and things behind that but let's just say for the record that if he could have gotten that wall built to say you know 25 to 50 billion dollars right well, that, those billions of dollars, you know, a fraction of that could have been done in a technological frontier, which would have been much more effective than a physical wall, because all a 30-foot wall does is create a market for 31-foot ladders. And then the other thing that you could have done is invest the rest of that money, since it only would have taken a fraction of it to have a technological frontier, drones, uh, infrared cameras, motion sensors, things like that. And the rest of that money could have been invested in helping get those other countries on track and help them deal with their problems. It would not only give us a foothold of influence with some of those countries and some of the stuff that they're doing, and we could have gotten that money back in kickbacks that we would have gotten from some of the industries that they could have gotten off of their feet and created for some of their people, helping to curb some of the drug problems and helping to curb some of the issues that are keeping their citizens from being able to live a productive life there. You know, that's something that we're, we could have instituted a program that could have paid for itself over time if we would have just had the, the, you know, the foresight to do it. 
but we've not done it in so long. And now we're in a situation now where, you know, it feels like we've reached this critical level. Um, and I'm not sure if we're actually at critical level yet, but we're at a situation now where we are starting to really understand and how people who are watching this unfold are starting to truly understand that in order to attack this problem, this isn't a flip the light switch thing anymore. That time has passed. We now have, there's going to be a lot more, it's going to take a lot to, you know, to, to, of thinkers and a lot of investment of money and resources in order to fix a problem like this. Because now, again, we've let it go too long. And these things can still be done, but the more time we waste, the, the worse it gets. I, I most definitely agree. Um, kind of, I heard over the week, you know, um, a great way that we could uh, go ahead and get kind of support uh, down in Texas right now from the national government. Uh, probably the simplest solution I would see uh, is using the National Guard uh, to actually help uh you know, if that helps bring down some of the number of the actual crossings that we're seeing uh, on a weekly basis, uh, maybe that's something we could do at a national level to go ahead and be effective uh, in the current. But as you said, you know, with all these issues that we do discuss and things of that nature, there needs to be uh, policies put in place uh, years ahead of time to preempt uh, a lot of these issues. And so we're not dealing with it uh, when we get sick, uh, we're dealing with it, you know, before these issues uh, actually occur within the country. Um, because as you said, uh, I honestly don't think this is the quote unquote critical level that I don't even think that we're gonna see before this is all said and done, to be honest. But uh, granted, it, it does become hard uh, be, for Biden uh, and the Democrat or Biden and his administration in the aspect of uh, kind of the fundamentals that they ran on and having to attack this issue kind of with a, uh, a iron fist uh, being more so, as you said, it, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, coming from the Democratic Party. But uh, I think in that same breath that the Republicans are kind of using uh, this issue, uh, you know what they say, uh, the loser of the battle or however you want to say, will find every issue that they can uh, in your arsenal to bring out uh, and make it public. And I think that the Republicans knew they kind of had a foothold uh, with the border crisis and issues going on right now. And they're kind of... Uh, standing on that uh, footing right now uh, with their party and trying to say, oh, well, this is where Biden and uh, Kamala's uh, administration is not uh, working is right now at the border, which I believe the borders maybe with this administration, how fast they've been moving. I mean, we're January, February, March. Uh, we're only four months uh, into the year, three months into this administration. I mean, they have made a ton of progress, you know, this far as far as the way as fast as policies is rolling out uh a lot of the things we're seeing get passed through in legislation so in that aspect uh the border crisis is the main issue i think right now uh on the negative side that this administration needs to attack uh so that we can be able to or at least uh suppress uh, a lot of the things going on at the border right now so we can concentrate on a lot of the domestic issues, but uh, this is something that's only becoming a bigger issue as the days pass if we don't figure out how to kind of uh, put, I don't know, a, a cap on uh, the border situation currently and uh, make sure we're not seeing an influx of uh, migrants way faster than we can actually handle as a country uh, is the main issue on that end. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it's kind of like I said earlier, you know, it, it really does come down to when you're not going to have a fight about facts, you need to have a fight about visuals, right? The visual of the, you know, the micro children and they're being, you know, in this o the overcrowded facilities and things like that, you know, those things are going to be the ones that grab all the headlines. One of the things that does not grab the headlines is the fact that numbers right now of border crossings are comparable to numbers in 2019. 
Those are the sort of things that you're not going to hear because there's a different administration in charge in 2019. As a matter of fact, you know, the, the iron fisted level of draconian measures that were going to keep people from crossing the border that supposedly was in place in 2019, like I said, we're seeing the same numbers that we see now. It's just it's disproportionate to children now. So again, this is a war of visuals, right? So when it comes to this thing, you know, it's definitely something that the, that the Biden administration is going to have to look at a little bit differently and out of the box. But the bottom line is, if they really want to get a handle on the border crisis, they're going to have to have strong adult conversations. And you're going to have to have those conversations with the American people and with the kind of plow ahead, you know, mentality that they had with the COVID response is the type of plow ahead mentality that you have to have with this and you move forward. And you do two things. Number one, you make sure you're taking your messaging to the people. Make sure we understand exactly what's going on. Make sure we understand the severity of it, understand what you're doing and why. And then the second thing is you have to point out if if you're going to have to go it alone to make these policies happen, then do so and make sure everybody understands why. When, when it came down to the COVID relief bill, they went ahead and plowed ahead and they were like, listen, these guys aren't being serious over here with solutions, so we're going ahead. So when you have 17 senators jump in boats and float down the Rio Grande with a couple of Marines, they're not being serious about the problem. That's not, that's not going to fix policy. That's not going to help anyone. That's not going to do anything. All that is is sensationalism for sensational state. And we are at a point now, and, and you, know, you and I talked about this in, in an earlier discussion, but it definitely applies here. We're in a situation right now where all these different issues that we have in the country are going on. We definitely have an economic crisis going on. We have an immigration crisis going on. COVID is still a huge problem, even though we've now gotten to the point where one out of four Americans is now fully vaccinated. That's something that we didn't even think was possible a couple of months ago. So with all of these different things going on, there needs to be serious adults in these positions that they were elected to making serious decisions. And jumping in a boat and rolling down like you're reshooting your own Rambo movie is not doing it. It is not helping anybody. It's not getting anything done. It's not helping those migrant children that you wanted to show a camera on. It's not helping to make sure these things are happening. There needs to be the type of, like I said, not only political discussion, but diplomatic discussion on being able to take care of something like this and avert this crisis and bring it under control and bring it to a place where you can take care of situations where you don't have an exodus out of your country, where Mexico has, doesn't have to deal with the fact of you having Central Americans having to migrate all the way up to your country heading out, and then they're getting stuck at the border where you're having to deal with it, along with the United States having to deal with it. This is a problem for multiple, multiple countries, so there has to be a large coalition of people working on this issue in order to get it done. And I don't hear anything about that but I see a lot of video of people standing in reeds, you know, knee deep in water, pointing at the border at night. You know, we need to have serious conversations to deal with serious problems. And that's what these people are supposed to be here for. And we've got to do a better job, I think, as, yeah, as voters and as citizens of holding them to account for that. Because I guarantee you, I can almost guarantee you this, none of the people that played these little stunts they're not going to pay for these stunts at the at the ballot boxes next time next go around. There needs to be a longer memory about stunts like this and about an inability to actually get things done. At your job, at my job, any place else, if we were as productive as Congress was, we'd be fired. And that needs to be like the standard of productivity going on in this country. And, you know, we, we're all about being productive. We're all about working hard. And, you know, getting those pants on in the morning and getting out there and doing work. And we don't ask any of that from so many of these leaders that we've elected to office. There's too many people in Congress. They're not even on committees. There's too many stunts. There's too many commercials. There's too many TikTok videos. There's too many Instagrams and tweets. And none of these problems are getting fixed. And we need to demand more of these people. And that's the last thing I kind of wanted to uh, end with today on our discussion is more so than anything uh, kind of directed today to the border crisis. But even on our past, uh, speaking of policies that should be being discussed, uh, the, this border crisis, you're dealing with actual uh, human beings. 
you're dealing with children even uh more time nine times out of ten uh which makes it even something more immediate that uh there needs to be action uh to deal and curve this issue and figure out how we can uh fix it as best as possible but um this is something that as you said uh similar with the COVID, as urgent as that was uh needing to be done in a timely manner uh this border issue is another one that needs to be done in a timely manner and uh handled pretty promptly uh we need to go ahead and start seeing action boots on the ground uh with that like yesterday um so that we can let other countries know you know we want of course especially uh with our organization we of course want more people coming within the country and things of that nature but we want it to be uh in a healthy way where it's good for both parties a person coming into the country and also uh, our citizens who are already in, within the country so uh that's going to take a lot of policy and a lot of uh legislation to actually get fulfilled and you know on the policy and that's not something that's going to be done tomorrow but uh we got to start seeing action on these uh issues like as i said yesterday uh is especially on something of that nature when dealing with uh children uh minority children is uh bigger than anything um kind of running through a couple of things we're doing with the organization currently uh we have the contest running uh right now where you can actually receive uh one of the ancestry.com dna kits we have the flyer listed on the uh organization group page currently if you wanted to read into what are the requirements and things of that nature uh kind of a couple of people on our audience platform that listen to our uh meetings on there we would also like to invite you guys to participate in this contest also so if that's something that will interest you there's a link on the audio audience page directly uh linking to the actual group page on facebook uh so you can be able to enter the contest uh that way <clears throat> mark any other uh announcements on your end as far as uh other things we have going on uh with the organization currently uh no i think that i think that covers it i mean again you know for anyone who has ever been curious or anyone who does not know or anyone who thinks they know um you know exactly what their you know dna ancestry is you know i, I would challenge you to you know to go ahead and you know jump into that contest and you know take that test and take the plunge and kind of see where that leads you because it, it provides so much more clarity to you know to not just to yourself but you know it, it's it's a it's a true amount of cultural clarity where you get a chance to really you know see like yes yeah, that you know that's where my people come from that's where so much of my you know my DNA comes from that you know kind of where you know where, where I get my you know some of my skin tone where my hair comes from where you know all, all these different things and be able to you know really look at that it, it really humanizes and solidifies what we are um and, and you know it, it's a wonderful experience so you know it it's a you know good prize to have but even more so, you know, being able to connect connect some of those stories and what brought you, you know, what would bring you to the organization? What made you listen to one of these, you know, um, one of these webcasts for the first time? What made you, you know, post something on the page or like something that you saw on the page? You know, what what brought you to that? What you know, what part of the struggle is the part that's the most important to you? And, and that's the sort of thing that you know, you may not know who you touch when you do that. You may not know that somebody who's on the fence about it or, or someone who felt a certain way about it and, and thought that no one understood and is able to be touched by your story. And, you know, and, and it brings them under the tent and it gives them peace and it brings them a level of, you know, appreciation for their own situation and by bringing them into our own, you know, that's what this organization is all about really it's not just in, in lifting and uplifting you know the minority community and you know for all marginalized people but it's also bringing us together we are all brothers and sisters in struggle so being able to you know come together and bring those things together you know that's something that's, that's you know very cathartic 
in, in dealing with the things that we see and the things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, being able to have a prize on top of that, that's also, that, that's also important and helping with that, that sort of uh, uplifting um, mission is super important. So I would say, you know, again, as we end all these calls, we're telling you to take care of each other, you know, be sure to get after it, look at the, you know, take a look at it, you know, enter into the contest, and you know, be paying attention to what's going on out there. And we definitely, uh, our biggest goal is to get as many people involved uh, with this movement as possible, uh, especially by doing the contest and kind of the uh, contest we also ran in uh, December and things of that nature. We're just looking for a little bit of engagement uh, from people when dealing with these issues, uh, trying to make sure that the flame behind this movement uh, does not die out and we're uh, continuing to keep these conversations uh, at the front of uh, things that we're doing, uh, especially when we're talking about the total fight for equality uh, for minorities, uh, not only just across America, but uh, across the world in general. Uh, we just want for everybody to have a opportunity, same playing field uh, and opportunities in life uh, at whatever success means to them, uh, whether you're a minority or not. Uh, that's our goal uh, with everything that we do. So thank you again for uh, participating in our meeting today. As I said, uh, if you would like to join in on the contest, that is again, uh, posted on our actual group page on Facebook. And we look forward to hearing uh, from a lot of people and hearing a lot of people's stories uh, from the movement and uh, what's kind of drove them into the movement themselves.